Yes, sir. Yes, sir. We are live. We are live. Much love, everybody. Uh, let's see who we got in the house here. Tone Loke Buds, much love. G, Filthy Rich, what up? Hectic Nasty. Strange Jays, much love. G, great pick. <laughs> uh, K, sir, what up? G, much love, homie. Yeah, so uh, I'm very excited about, about this interview today. Uh, you know, I remember seeing this documentary and also uh, talking about it with Yahira when we had our um, when we had our, our, our show together. So it's something that uh, I always wondered what happened and it's a trip and it's good to see uh, homie doing well and free. So we have a uh, Jared. What up G Jared Nava. Hello. How's everybody doing? How's it going? Uh, how are you? Uh, much love. G appreciate you jumping on today. And uh, again, just want to, while we have you here, I uh, just want to thank you for, for taking the time to tell your story and chop it up with us today. Absolutely. So I'd like to get started from the, the very beginning, if possible. Uh, I, I like to know, like, just from the very start, because I want to see, like, the steps of your life, right? Uh, how was your life growing up? Uh, so um, I grew like, growing up, uh, I moved around a lot. Uh, I didn't know my real dad. My real dad wasn't a part of my life. So uh, for the first, like, five years of my life, it was just my mom. And my mom had gotten into the Navy. And so we kind of started to move around, you know, I kind of became like a little Navy baby. Mm -hmm. And then um, she met my stepdad, which is um, the, the father of my three sisters. And so uh, when she met him, uh, she ended up getting pregnant and we moved to Pomona. And so we moved to Pomona with him and his family. And that's kind of like my real introduction to like family in general as well. Like, yeah. you know, kind of just being with my mom, I didn't have much family other than like family that had adopted her. And so, uh, I kind of got adopted into this huge, you know, uh, this huge family, which was amazing, you know, in my youth. Like I have a lot of um, great memories in, of my childhood. I think one of the things though, and looking back that was detrimental in um, my youth was just moving around so much. Yeah. Like going from, like we went from going to school in Pomona to North Hollywood to um, San Bernardino, like just like all, we just were like bouncing all over the place or like every school, like I probably went to like, uh, every school in Pomona and then like, you know, just kind of never really had like that stability that just kind of that home. Yeah, I believe and, uh, I read a, a study that said uh, for kids that move around a lot more, they're mo they're more subject to anxiety, uh, depression and just other. It's just because, like you said, there's a lack of stability there. Right. You, you got to make friends everywhere you go now. You know, you kind of got to reestablish yourself. Right over, yeah. um, so from there, you know, I kind of. uh I had a I had a pretty like normal childhood. I'm not gonna lie. Like there was I mean there was things that went on in the household, like like every household, you know. Um, and I was kind of taught at a young age, you know, you don't talk about the things that happen in our house because that's our business. And I carried that belief for a long time. And um, I think though, like my passion as as a kid, though my passion was playing sports. You know, I love playing baseball. So it's like that was like my my escape. You know, that was that's what I love to do. And uh, from there, you know, I just continued to grow up. Uh, I had I, I had family that were that were gang members, you know, so I was kind of exposed to it. Um, you know, I seen shootings and all that that people see, you know, growing up where we come from. And uh, honestly, like most of my life too, I just worked. You know, I started working at uh, probably like eleven years old. Uh, every day after after school, I would go work. Um, like they used to pick us up in vans and we used to go sell newspapers and chocolates, yeah, and yeah, yeah. <laughs> jumper cables, candles. Yeah. Like, you know, we used to go door to door. So I didn't really have a shy bone in my body. You know, you know, you have to go and knock on random strangers doors. You kind of learn to just get real vocal. Yeah. And so I did that for a long time. And then um, I ended up dropping out of high school. Like my parents separated, uh, my mom and my stepdad separated. And uh, they talk about some of that in a documentary, like some of the, uh, like some of the stuff that was going on. Yeah. And then, um, uh, I think shortly after they separated, I, I got jumped into the the um, the gang that I was from, and uh, it, it didn't it didn't take long, you know. I kind of like spiraled real fast, um, and then caught caught uh, caught the case that that I did. Damn. Well, what, what what? How old were you when you started uh like gravitating towards like gangs and started? Because I know you said very earlier on you were working and 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 playing sports. So how how did you? to find time to like start hanging out with the uh, gang members 
I think like in school, like that, those were my friends. Like in school, those are my friends. But after school, like I would go play baseball and they were kicking it on the block. And I think uh, when I was 11, actually, we couldn't afford, I couldn't afford to, to play sports anymore. Yeah. So instead of sports, I worked. And then a lot of the people that I was working with were, were people who were, you know, young, but they were from the block and they were kicking it already. And then, you know, we would go to work together and, and you know, do that. That's when I first started smoking weed. You know, like I'm, I'm out with a lot of a lot of cats that are older to a lot of them were 15, 16, 17 already. And yeah. I'm like 11 years old and I'm like, all right, this is what we do. You know what I mean? Like we smoking bud and like, you know, then going out and selling. So I think that that's when I started like kind of getting exposed to it. And I seen it like, um, it didn't seem like, to me, it didn't seem like a, like a bad thing. Like, oh, this is like a bad thing. Like this leads, like, I didn't really see a lot of people go to jail. Like, you know what I mean? I didn't really see a lot of the negative consequences of that lifestyle. I think, you know, in my, in my youth. So you just seen with the the rush, the adrenaline rush, and all, all that, the excitement, but you didn't see the the downfall of of all of it. Well, in actuality, like I, I was I was sharing this not that long ago in, in a conference. Is like when you join a gang, you get a lot of what you're looking for in a family, or like what you find when you're playing sports. You know, you get um, a group of people who come together um, with one common goal, right? And um, you kind of have like an objective you're moving towards something like you you're every day you know you guys are trying to grind to get to something right and then you just have that community of people like a brotherhood and i think that when i couldn't afford to play sports anymore i found that um with those people and yeah. i think a lot a lot of kids do you know if you don't have a, a strong a strong or a solid foundation in your household you know you find a big brother in the streets or you find somebody that's like a father figure you know like like a big homie but is there like a father figure you know and uh, you, you know, these are the people that if you need somewhere to go, like they're opening up their their house to you, they're feeding you, like you know, they if you don't got no, if you dirty, you've been on the block three days, you know, they putting clothes on your back. So, um, I think that like a lot of it was initially was like family, and I think a lot of people who join gangs have uh, an amazing amazing qualities, right? They just get manipulated. Like I think a lot of people have loyalty, uh, commitment, you know, honor, like a lot of qualities that if channeled in the right direction can make them very successful and it's just it's just it gets manipulated and twisted sometimes well well definitely i, I always believe that most people i always say most people that commit crimes at a young age or or uh join gangs there's something going on there right that like you say that there there's there's underlying issues that, that need to be addressed but a lot of the times they're they're ignored because you put out this harder exterior right like you don't want people to that's your way of protecting yourself, right? You don't want people to figure out what's wrong with you. So you kind of show them that there's something wrong, but you don't let them uh, all the way in. And a lot of times it becomes frustrating for people. Like, I can't deal with this kid. Fuck it. Lock him up. Right. Damn. So, and how old were you when you were fighting that case again? I was uh, 17. 17 years old. Damn. So you're like right at the edge of like adulthood. Yeah. I had just turned 17 too. Like, I like I committed this crime um, probably like a, not even a month after I turned 17. So it was like real fresh. Damn. Yeah. So, so when you got busted for it and, and you found out, like, you found out that you're facing all this time as a 17-year-old, like, what, what what did that feel like to you? Were you, were you in, you're from Pomona, so were you in LP? Was LP still existing at the time? Yeah, so uh, my first night I go to, to booking in LP, I'm in the little tank, um, at first, I'm like, this is nothing, you know what I mean? Like, it's gonna, yeah. it's gonna work out. Like, I'm like, no, I never seen nobody get caught for nothing. Like, I never like, I was like, this is gonna blow over. It's gonna be smooth. I may get like some camp time or something. And so I go into LP, and uh, the staff, they're telling me like, I, cause you know how they can see like your charges. They're, they're telling me like, hey, try to get juvenile life. So I'm like, all right, like I'm like, <laughs> I don't even know what that means at this point, right? I'm just yeah. like, I'm just new. Like, I'm just new in the in the system. Do and, your ass orange real quick, uh. Yeah, and uh, my first court date, I actually go a day earlier, and so I'm like, all right, and I go, and uh, everybody else is getting called into court. I'm in the juvenile tank. Everybody else is getting called in, and then a, a public defender comes and sees me, and he's like, hey, look, this is what you're facing. And they're like, 25 to life, 25 to life, 25 to life, 25. And I just went. I remember I was just looking at him like, what? Like, I was sick. Like, I didn't know what. I didn't. I didn't understand what I was. I didn't understand what was happening, right? So I yeah. go back into the tank and I'm just like, damn, I'm getting washed up. And then they're like, yeah, I'm out. Like, <laughs> they're like, they're like, damn, that's your bad. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I, when I, go ahead, my go bad. Ahead. 
now I was saying then like getting back to LP and getting transferred to to Selmar to the compound, that's when it like really hit me and it was just like I felt like everything got drained out of my body. Like the first like month and I seen it with everybody who came after me, like like the first month or so, like you're just like like a shell of who you were, you know what I mean? Like you just kind of are just like on autopilot because it's just it's crazy. Like everybody's facing life. And when you first get hit with it, it just it gets real. Like this is not a game no more. Like this is not a slap on the wrist. This is not we're going to be out in six months. This is like, yeah, they got you. Yeah. And the trip about Pomona Court, um, like for those who've never been there, it's it's a real trippy setting, too, because it's dark. Like it's like a like there's no windows. Right. Like there's a window to see inside where the staff are. And then there's a door, boom, and then you're just in. I don't know if it was like that when you were there. When I was there, it's just like a big ass holding cell where they throw everybody in there. And after you find out news, like you don't have time to just chill or relax or really feel what you're supposed to be feeling because you're in there with everybody else right away, right? You come right. back from the courtroom, they throw you back in there, and they don't know what's happening. Everybody's like, "What happened? What happened?" And you're right. just fuck man i'm looking at this much time how, how was that for you like did you try to hide any of those feelings or like did or did you even realize that anyone was there or were you kind of just ignoring them um i think when i first got the time like and when i was in the first holding tank it was just kind of like you just kind of like it was just in like shock like you, there wasn't even yeah. not even tripping on what anybody else was thinking about what i was going through it was more so just shocked like damn what does this even mean and then I think when I got to the compound, everybody was facing life sentences. So it was just normal. Like, like they pulled up, like, oh, how much time you face? I'm like, all day. And they're like, okay, yeah, like, it's good. Like, the culture was, like, the culture was, like, that was the norm. So it wasn't, like, that's they weren't funny. looking at you, like, oh, damn, that's crazy. They were like, yeah, like, we, you know, we, I've been fighting my case for, like, six months or whatever. Like, it was just a different, it was a different culture. That's a trip because uh, when I was, when I was in the halls, it was a little different when we were, uh, when you had kids fighting their cases, you had to fight your fitness. But I think after Prop 21, they took that away. So with you, did they – was it the prosecutor that decided or did you go through the whole fitness uh, trial? No, I didn't even get a chance to fight my fitness. It was just direct files. Yeah, I think it's – yeah, Prop 21 did that. That's fucked up, man. That's what I always try to say. Like those, those laws, they don't realize like these are kids and, and they're, they should be systems set up so that you can see, right? Like because if you fought your fitness, you may have had a different outcome. But then – they just said, nah, the prosecutor who's supposed to prosecute you gets to decide that, which is kind of fucked up, man. Yeah. Damn. So they, they, they send you to Silmore and um, you're, you're in the compound. When you're there, you're kind of closed out from everybody else, right? right? You can't go out with everybody. Did you guys school? From what I remember from when I from tell me if it's the same from when I was there. School's there. Visiting's there. You eat there. Like, everything is there. You hardly go out with anyone else. Is that how it was for you? Yeah, the only difference is they have a uh, they have a place for school now. So you okay. go out, you actually go out to school. Unless, like, we got in trouble, then they do, they do uh, like, school in the unit. But everything else is still in the unit. You eat in the unit. You're busy. You don't ever really leave the unit unless you want a medical or something. So, Damn. And, and you said everybody there is facing life. You're young. How is that for a little kid? 17 years old, you don't really really know what life is at that point. How is it for you to kind of like, because I know you might be having different thoughts like, ah, I could do it. And then other thoughts like, fuck, that's a long time. Do you even realize how long that is? Nah, everybody's talking about like trying to get a deal for like, I remember the first time I asked for a deal for like, they're like, what what will you take? I was like, I'll take 20 right now. Like not even understanding what 20 years was, right? Like, yeah, just that was just like, we used to talk about amongst each other. Like how much time you'll take? Like, oh, I'll take like 15 or I'll take like, you know, like that was like what we used to talk about because it seemed like anything was better than getting an actual life sentence. Yeah, Uh, you're right though. Low key. Like shit. Yeah. Like if I could get just any number without the life is good. Yeah, that's what, that's what the homies even said. Uh, if they're offering you nine to life uh, or, or 20 years, take the 20. Yeah. Yeah. Which shit. is crazy, though, because it's just like 20 years is a long time. Yeah. <laughs> how, how did they approach you to, to start the filming? Did they Were they there with the film crew when you started uh, They Call Us Monsters? They started that documentary. Were they there with the uh, camera crew? before or did they tell you guys like oh they're gonna come in and they might want to talk to you guys like how did they how did they address that um i think scott scott brought in 
uh, Ben Lear, which was the director, and then Gabe, which was the guy that was kind of like running the class. He brought them in uh, to our unit. Um, and at, at night we're in, in day room at night and he just brought them in and then he like, he's like, Hey, talk to them. And then, so I started talking to one of them and then he had, I think Antonio was talking to another dude. So I think they kind of had it planned out. I don't know how, like people always ask me, I don't even know how we got chosen for it. Like, I don't know like what the process, I don't remember what the process was. I just remember getting asked, like, you want to do it? And I was like, yeah, <laughs> like let's do it. Like, yeah. Cause uh, what people don't know about the, the compound is, is there's two sides, right? So yeah. it, there's two sides. And it's like they they really shrunk it down. It looked like to to a few uh, uh, a few minors that they chose, right? Like I think there was about three three of you guys, and they showed a few other people. But they really shrunk it down to how, how much it is, right? Like like how how not that it's a huge compound, but the the each unit is pretty it's pretty sizable. So there's a lot of people who didn't make it to film. Yeah, there's like 17 people on each side, like so. And and, I, and that's the thing. Like I tell people, like it's like it's not like my story or anybody in that story was special or different. It's like that's that was just a story of a bunch of like of like what everybody in there was facing. Like yeah. everybody getting railroaded and everybody like not to say not to like I try never to negate the fact that like people were really hurt. You know, like like there was like there's a real victim and there's people were were hurt. However, like the criminal justice system is definitely flawed. And yeah. it just highlights, you know, what what a lot of people. I mean, I don't know what year you were there, but years since, like, I think, like, oh four, oh five, of kids going through there and getting stretched out. Yeah, well, yeah, no, I remember, I I was fortunate enough to go to YA, but uh, I was fighting my case in ninety nine. Oh. Uh, when I was fighting my case, I was in a. They sent everybody who were like high risk offenders and and uh, to Central at first, LP and ENF, and then Central M and N and K and L. And I remember it, it was rough because you would see cats go to court and they'd go as a group and you'd only see a few of them come back. And you'd be like, what happened to homie? Oh, he got 30 to life, dog. He's going to the county tomorrow. I was like, damn. Because I guess after you got sentenced, they wouldn't keep you there. Like you, yeah. you fight your fitness there. You fight your case there. But after you got sentenced, they threw you in a lockup. And the next day you went to the county. And right. I would just trip out when I heard those numbers. I was like, I was glad I was going to why. I was like, fuck, that's a long ass time. Like, damn, man. Yeah. So let's so how did you end up building that rapport with the uh with with everybody? Like the uh the producers, the 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 main director and all that. How did you end up building that rapport with them? Like to be in it? Like just they it seems like they took an interest in you. Like even I even that's all like, I don't even know. Like, to be honest, I just was in, like, I was in Inside Our Writers when I was there. Yeah. But I don't know, like, why they chose us or, or who they chose. Like, like I don't know how their process went as far as who they wanted to put in the documentary. I know, like, we got blessed, though, because they only came to W. They didn't go to X. And so X yeah. was another unit. And Z as well. They only went to, to W. So I guess, I don't know. They had they had a vision. I guess they seen it. So Damn. And you mentioned there was only 17 kids per side. So you guys were single celled? Yeah, it's all single cell. Oh, that's great. That's interesting. Okay, so so damn. So how damn? So most of your time you were probably slammed down then, right? A lot of time in the cell. A lot of time to think. By yourself. Fuck. Yeah. How was that, dog? Uh that was probably like the hardest part. Like just learning how to like I think being like before, like always being at the park all day long, like being in the streets, always in the park to like being stuck like that not, not having no control of when and how you could go outside like that was hard i think you know just learning how to like manage the time learning how to read books how to work out just kind of learning how to to develop some type of program how to write letters like and then like write them like like do all this stuff like with a routine because some days like it just be hard like you just want to get out like i'm just tired of being here you know what it reminds me of too it's kind of sad uh, uh kind of like the dog pound when the staff will walk by you and you hear the keys, like they're going to open somebody's door. Yeah, kind of everybody comes to the door. <laughs> you hope they're going to open your door. Yeah. That's sad though, man. Cause like, you're right. You fucking lose your mind there. You got to have some kind of routine. Cause damn, that shit sucks. Sucks. So, so you're filming the movie. Did, did, did you know it was going to be a movie or documentary? Like what, what did you think it was? Now, to be honest with you, I don't even know. Like they just like, so like for most of the time like the beginning like i was high like the whole time 
I'm not yeah. gonna lie. Like the mo- like I was I was high like pretty much the first part of it. So I wasn't even like really like taking it serious or really tripping out on what it could be or what it was. Like I was just going over there and we got to be out of the cell. We got to be out of that the unit we were in. They used to bring food. So I just seen it like it was an opportunity to kind of be out. Yeah. And uh I just would go over there and kind of just just joke. I, I think I didn't understand like what they were even developing until until i seen it like when i was in prison and they they screened it for me and juan i didn't even see like or understand like w- like how big it was gonna be yeah that's a trip that's that's a trip and, and i noticed a lot of it when i was watching uh just as a as a spectator right like just somebody v- viewing the, the 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 documentary i seen a lot of your antics and i was like damn he's real immature like that that's a real immature kid and it's not because there was anything wrong with you. You were a kid. And I think that's kind of what it highlighted is, is you were you were a young, and all of you guys were young men, right? Like youngsters. You didn't know anything. I don't I doubt that you really understood a lot of the severity of what was happening. You may have understood parts of it, but I, I don't know. To me, it looked like, damn, he doesn't know what's ahead of him. Like he really doesn't know. Uh, it, I, I might, I might, am I might accurate with that? Or or like take me back to that time is or, or did you have it figured out, but you just wanted to mess around? No, nah, I think definitely that was like, that was my coping mechanism though. Like on the daily was just to yeah. like clown. Like that's just how I, I got through every day was just like making a joke of everything, not really taking anything serious. Yeah. Cause it's hard to look at that and take that seriously. You're facing all those years. That's scary, dog. I don't care what anyone says. Like you could be the hardest cat, but you're there's a possibility you're never going home again. Like yeah. you're never gonna see freedom. That's a scary thing. You're gonna die in a cell. Like that's a yeah. scary thing to think about. So yeah, you don't know how to deal with that. What are you gonna do? I'm gonna crack a joke. Like that's fuck it. it. Yeah. <laughs> Damn. So did they start wrapping up the uh, documentary when you were there, or was it after you were shipped out? I forgot about that part. Um. So they kind of like we kind of did our final stuff like because they had like a like a contract kind of to keep us there, so they kept they kept us there past like we t- went past our 18th birthday, mm-hmm. and so then like getting towards the end like they started like you could tell they kind of started wrapping it up and we kind of had to like really start putting the the script together in a hurry, and then uh they just caught the like the the end of our our court proceedings, um. Uh, well, me and Juan went to the county jail. So the rest of the stuff they filmed while while we were in uh, LA County Jail. How was that for you catching that chain from Silmore to the to the county jail? Man, that was crazy. That was like, like for anybody who's gone through that process, like I always explain it, like it is is dehumanizing. Honestly, like you go, you're like it's it's hella bright. The lights are on just the whole time, and so. You don't know what time of day it is, right? You're just in there. <laughs> and then, uh, man, then they, when they finally, like, call you to the next tank, and then you're waiting there for hours, and then they call you to the, like, to to basically just get butt naked. Like, they put you, get you butt naked and throw you into this little cell to, to put you in the showers. Like, that whole thing was just crazy. Like, you see people, like, like kicking. Like, they're just, like, like, they're coming down. Like, it's just... It was crazy. Like that whole process, I was just paying attention. Like I'm just like trying to like know what I'm supposed to do. Like you hear stories of like, uh, like kind of just what you're supposed to do. And so I think like my eyes are just open. Like okay, it's real. Like this is not. It's not like no more games. You know. Like it, yeah. it's it's time to like really really um be on point. And so it was it was scary though, bro. Like I ain't gonna lie. That thing was that thing was hella scary. Like going through that whole process just. Like the unknown, like not knowing what's next, and then like going into a dorm at like three in the morning, and the dorm is just popping. Like it's just like a wild dorm, and it's just like people all over the place. Like it's pitch black in there though, apart from like maybe like a TV on, and the the shower, the uh, the bathroom lights. Like I landed in a fifty five fifty, like in two like when in two thousand thirteen, I landed in fifty five fifty, and it was just like it was just it was cracking in there. <laughs> so it was a trip, like going in there and then just getting laced up on everything. It was just yeah, definitely a culture shock because uh, it, it does seem like uh, from when I when I was in in the halls, and I'm pretty sure it was probably the same when you were there. 
the staff really had control of it, it seemed like. Right? Yeah. So at three in the morning, everyone's asleep. Right. right. For the most part. So that must be a culture shock. Like you're probably expecting everyone to be asleep and you walk in, everyone's awake. Like, what the fuck? It's like a little city in there. Like you walk in, you're like, what the hell is going on? It's crazy. It's Damn, crazy. man. So how long were you in the county uh, fighting your case? I was in the county since from November of 2013. And then I got shipped out May of 2014. So like maybe like six months. Six months fighting your case. When, when they sentence you, right? It, you, yeah. Because it seems like even then, I don't, I don't, I don't know. It, again, maybe it's your coping mechanisms, but it seems like maybe a lot of it really didn't so like seep in how which how serious it was that you were fighting because you were kind of smiling and, and shit like that. But when they broke you off, it didn't seem like it bothered you too much. Uh, you know, but but how 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 was it for you hearing that like deep inside? What did you what did you feel when they broke you off with all those years? I, I think I had like gone through like my mourning process of that, like when I lost child. Like when I lost child, that's when it was like like damn, it broke me down, you know? Yeah. That's when it that's when it hit hard. Like I was okay, I got like it didn't matter what to life. Like I just knew I was gonna get like. So yeah. I think when I lost child, it prepared me like for the sentencing. Like the sentencing, like it was like like I, I definitely was putting on a mask and laughing it off, but it was like this dude just keeps saying numbers. Like this judge, like he literally just keeps saying numbers. I can't keep up with what you're talking about. Like yeah, it was like it was comical in a sense because it's like you just throwing all these like like, like how many all these years? Huh? I'm not gonna live a hundred years. Like what the hell? Like and then it's just I guess that was just my like there was like. Uh, like my family, like I didn't want to break down for in front of my family. Like I wanted to like at least be strong for them, and so I think I tried to like it's gonna be okay, like it's gonna be good, and try to show them that like I was all right, you know. Yeah. But I think when I went to reception, uh, so I went to reception, and like when I started to sit on it, that's when I was like, damn, like you're never going home. Fuck. Yeah. How did that feel, dog? That was that was real. Like it was. It kind of felt like that first process of being transferred to the compound, knowing I was facing life. Like when I, like going into prison with the life sentence was like, damn, it's over. You know, like it's just like that's it. Like this is life now. You know. How how was your how was your attitude? Were you like I'm gonna get my ride on, or or was it like shit? This is my home. I better try to make it as comfortable as possible. Like what what was your thought process? Um, initially I was just like a sponge, you know, I'm just like watching everything I'm seeing, like, like what, you, what, like what you're not supposed to do, watching people get, you know, watching people do dumb stuff, like learning from other people's mistakes. So at first I was just like really paying attention. And then I think I came to the position where I asked myself that question, like, what am I going to do? Like, am I going to like, am I going to wild out or am I going to, um, like give give my mom and everybody who's still in my life a reason to to have them like for a reason to write me you know what i mean yeah and so um i i contemplated that for a while and then i like i made like at first i was just chill though like i just i just programmed like i just moved through like um uh, just kind of did time you know i worked out just kind of stood quiet hung out with a small group of people and then uh i made a decision to be uh to become a christian and so when I made the decision to become a Christian, uh, I remember like going and tell, telling the homie that had the yard, like, hey, look, I'm like, I'm gonna serve God. And it's just like being young, like a lot of people didn't respect that. Like they're like, like, nah, <laughs> like I know at 18 here. years old with a life sentence, like it's like, nah, like you can't do that. But I just did it, you know, and uh I kept doing it. Like I I like they told me basically like that's a that's a thin line, you know, you can't do X, Y, and Z. And um I was real about it, you know, like it wasn't because I was running from anything. I, I stood mainline my whole time. I didn't run from anything. It's just um, I felt that conviction in my heart. You know, the more I began, like I started all that time in the cell reading the Bible and like that stuff just hit my heart. Like nobody told me like, hey, you should stop gang, You should stop uh, game banging or you should stop doing this. You should stop doing that. It just kind of was in my heart. Like, man, you know what? Like I felt I felt wrong introducing myself as, so, uh, you know, this person from here and then you know, it led to me just making that decision. 
Yeah. Uh, and I, I definitely want to touch on that, but I do want to, uh, Corey in the chat is asking this question. I think it's a very important question because, uh, we had done, uh, before you even got out a few years ago, I had a show called indigenous seasons podcast and we had done an episode on, on, they call us monster. I think both of us were pretty critical of your lawyer. Uh, and, uh, Corey's asking whatever happened to the female, female lawyer that represented him. Um, I heard like she had got like, like a lot of like hate mail and stuff like that, but I don't know like what happened to her. Like, I, like she was never in contact with me or I was never in contact with her after that. She was, um, she was actually like a family lawyer, like a, oh, like okay. a, or like a DUI lawyer. And I guess she posed as somebody that was a criminal lawyer and, you know, it, she shouldn't have even took the case because I brought her on the day the day before I was going to start trial. And so it's like a, a lawyer shouldn't, she shouldn't even came on as counsel with that little time to represent me as well. Yeah. All right. So, all right. Cool. So I, I want to talk about the, uh, uh, so you, like you said, there's a, a, a stigma when you're busted, right? Uh, about youngsters, like you said, youngsters turning to religion. Right? right, because a lot of people think it's a crutch, right? Ah, Vato is scared. He doesn't even trying to do the business, right? Yeah. So it must have been a, a hard decision for you, because I'm sure you knew about the stigma, right? So you had to, or, or, or maybe I'm wrong. Like, what, what made you come to that decision where you said, "No, this is what I want to do, and I'm going to do this"? Because you're right. It's a very, very there's there's not a lot of leniency there. They right. see something that you fuck up on. Thought you were Christian, homie. You're done, right? So, yeah. uh, 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 what what made you come to to that conclusion? And did you did you know there was a kind of a stigma about people who weren't serious about that? Yeah, I kind of had an idea, like of because I had seen, like when I was in the county jail, I had seen people become Christian and uh, and walk that out, and kind of the things that they faced. But I think that um, just my own convictions, you know, like like honestly, like I said, like reception, you spend a lot of time in the cell as well. Like you're pretty much in there all day long. So I think spending a lot of time in the cell and just um, reading the Bible for myself and just kind of talking to God, like I felt like I stopped doing little things at first. Like I stopped cussing, like not because anybody told me to, but I just stopped, you know, like I just felt like I just didn't want to cuss no more. And, you know, I, I stopped drinking and using drugs. Like I just stopped those things. And then um, I guess like it built, I built up that courage to be like, you know what? Like I want to do this all the way. Like yeah. I don't want to, I don't want to half step. I don't want to like, be out here acting one way and then go in the cell and read my Bible. Like, you know, I didn't want to, I didn't want to have steps. So I was like, it's either all or nothing. And so I just jumped in. Did anyone try to test the waters at first? Like, yeah, you ain't really a Christian hit this or, or anything like that. Or did they kind of respect the respect your call? No, nah, I mean, there was always people like that. Like there was always people like that, but um, I just kind of stood consistent with it. Like I just stood consistent with it. Like I just didn't want, like, it wasn't hard. Like it wasn't hard in the sense of like, the hardest thing was being disrespected by somebody and not doing something because I was my biggest enemy. Yeah. Like, I, like my self-talk was, was the, was the hardest part. Like whatever, like situations was not hard. It was the self-talk. Like, and I think that that's what a lot of people face, you know, like we're our biggest critics. You know, and, and that could be anything in life. You know, that could be uh, a job or whatever, right? Like not doing something right. Like you could feel like you could beat yourself up more than what the situation is. So I think I learned, like, because my idea of what a man was is like you got to fight and you got to be like a certain way. And I learned that like all that stuff was were things that I was taught that I had to trace back. So like, where did I get this ideology from? And then I had to challenge it and see what's was real. Like it doesn't mean that. You're a man because you fight everybody that <laughs> gets at you like a little wild or whatever, right? Like that doesn't make you a man. Like, so I think I just learned what a man was. Yeah, and, and I think that's hard because not that it's easier out here because you still have those same convictions out here. But if you act like that out here, most likely you're gonna end up in jail, right? So a jail is full of cats like that. They they have that. So yeah, it must be hard because that's the culture in there. Right. So you're kind of going yeah. against the norm. You're kind of going against the societal norms in there. It's like now you got to look the other way. You have to change everything when that's not what is really common in there. Yeah, that's, that's a trip, man. So and I want to ask this because I, I, I think that's that's interesting. Do you believe that had you not 
turn to to your fate that you would have had hope that you would get out one day? Would you have pursued an appeal uh, or or pursued a, a change in in the sentence, or do you think you may have just accepted it and went with what everyone else was doing? Yeah, I definitely would have. I definitely would have continued to. I would have put myself in some dumb situations because I always had a big mouth. You know what I mean? So mm. I think if if I hadn't made decision to serve Christ, like I definitely would have, I wouldn't be here right now. I know that for a fact, like just, just, it just wouldn't have happened. There would be no reason for me to, to like start to look at myself. Like I just would have, you know, been doing what I've seen a lot of my peers do. You know what I mean? Yeah. I should probably, if, if not nothing else, I probably would have still been blowing trees and like, and little things like that can keep you in prison as a lifer for longer than what you should be. Oh yeah. Yeah. Cause you, uh, you make yourself available to what's going on. At the same exactly. time, too, yeah. So that, that's a trip, man. When did you decide to pursue, uh, or how did you go about pursuing coming home one day? Like, because that's that's crazy. Because, like you said, you already accepted the fact that you may never see the streets again. What made you say, "I might be able to see the streets one day"? And let's let's look into getting out of here. Um. I think probably like six years into my sentence, like um, I got advised to file for commutation. This is when Brown was doing uh, commutations and somebody told me like, you should just try to put in for it. And I was seeing other people get commuted on the yard. So I was all right, I'll take a shot. But I never really had a hope of going home to be honest with you, like I never did. Like er like people who were in prison with me will, like, will tell you like, even my family, like I never was like, when I get out, like I never talked like that, like it was just like, I'm here, you know, and I just kind of made the best of my situation. And I, I mean, I took opportunities though. You know what I mean? I didn't say like, oh, I'm never going home, so I'm not going to do this. Like I always did everything just to kind of grow in there and try to be as successful as possible in there. And so I filed the commutation and I didn't even get the commutation until two years later after I filed. <laughs> and they just kind of came out the blue one day. Like I had came in from the yard one day. And uh, they just came and told me, like, hey, your sentence has changed to 10 to life. Like, just out the blue. So I never really had, like, a sense of going home until until then. When they commuted my sentence, then I was like, oh, damn, like, I can actually go home. Damn. Yeah. That, that's a trip. How did, how did that feel? It, it didn't feel It didn't feel real still, though. Like, it still yeah. was like, it almost feels like the lottery, right? Like, you try, like, you, you buy a ticket. You kind of like hope, but you like, I'm not going to win it. You know, like it's yeah, kind of yeah. like that. Because I was like, I still got to go in front of board. And then like, you just hear the horror stories about board. And, you know, you see some people getting found suitable. But like, there's a million and one reasons why you think you're not going to get it. You know what I mean? Like, it's yeah. just like, it just seems like this insurmountable um, mountain that you're that you're facing. Yeah, that's a, that's a trip, man. So how did they, uh, uh, you had to go to board when they, when they released you, how did that happen? Yeah. So I, I um, uh, I got my sentence commuted to 10 to life. So governor Newsom commuted me from 162 to life to 10 to life. And then, um, I had to go, I had to get the psyche valve and then I was stressing out the psyche valve cause I got a moderate. So I still posed a moderate risk for, for, um, Free offense for reoffense so i was like damn i got moderate and then the the uh 260 stuff said like um uh, the brain's not fully developed until the age of 25 so i was like damn i'm only 25 i'm like what if they're gonna spend that on me and say like oh his brain's barely developed or like it's not still it's, it may not fully be maybe come back in three years so um but i just i just like went all in bro like i covered every single area or topic that i thought that they could have hit me with um, I wrote essays. I I did a lot of uh, a digging into my past and, and kind of just was vulnerable and just, you know, talked about my childhood and put it all out there and um, talked about, you know, how I got involved in the lifestyle and, and like, you know, they just a lot of stuff, bro. I just like, I try not to leave anything out. I was like, this is like, this is the final fight. Like, I don't want to walk away from this feeling like I could have done something. Yeah. You don't want to leave the table. Right. And then with doing that, I, I, I got found suitable my first time. It was crazy. So when you're looking into that, digging into your past, what were some things that you found out about yourself that surprised you or, or 
like made you think like oh man like because i know you're probably collect, collecting a lot of dots like you said right uh man honestly like like insecurity like even saying that like saying i was insecure was like really hard to do you know what i mean like as a man like you don't want to say that i was insecure so i i think looking and seeing like the insecurities that i had um and then just kind of like a lot of my decisions being like a lot of decisions that I made um, at a young age um, were based on a lot of anger and a lot of like passive aggressiveness that I didn't deal with. And so like I would let things build up and then I'll explode, you know? And so I, like I realized like, you know, you got to be assertive. So like I think the like two of the main things was definitely like insecurity and passive aggressiveness that I didn't even know what those terms meant, you know? And then just digging into it, I realized like, those are two detrimental um, qualities about myself. Did you realize that you're going to have to, uh, like, deal with those, what, like, immediately and when you got out, as soon as you learned about them? Um, I had already began to, like, deal with them. Like, I had already been, like, like, I had learned in other classes. Like, I had, like, like began doing a lot of that work for, I had been doing it for, for years. Yeah. And so I kind of already had noticed it, and I learned to be, more assertive. I learned how to like, you know, still like without being aggressive and getting at people aggressively, not letting people walk over you either, you know, yeah. and kind of finding that middle ground. And then like uh, the insecurities, just like I had to, I had to become secure in those areas. Like, you know, those areas that I felt, um, you know, less than, you know, I had to realize that, man, it's like, there's nothing wrong with me. There's only one me. So. Yeah. Did you, uh, ever get the chance to to make amends with, with the victim or or speak to speak to her uh did, did they kind of did they kind nah, of that's her? like that's like a that, that would have been a like violation like that's a violation like to yeah. i feel like i'm open to it um but at the same time like i'm not i'm not gonna like reopen anything that somebody's not ready for either and i feel like that's that's wrong in this in one sense right like yeah, like no, if it's ever asked of me, like I'm more than willing to do it. But as far as like going and initiating it, I I feel like I I don't have that right to do that. I I I agree, G, because it's like that's you you completed your part of the story in that, and that's dope because you you made a complete change, right? But right. you're right. What if she's not ready? And it's you don't you don't want to just dig into it just to make you feel better. Uh, right. You want if it's right for her, then then yeah, that 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 would be awesome. But yeah, it it I, I agree with you. It should be her call, right? So you get out. How how long was it in total that you did? I ended up doing like eight and a half. Eight and a half. I, you yeah. thought you were going to do a hundred years? You get out in eight <laughs> and eight. Yeah. How, how does that feel, G? Man, it was amazing, bro. Like it literally felt like um like a backpack of bricks just fell off me, like. Like, it literally felt like I was carrying that weight with me every day. And then it just was off, you know, as soon as I walked out them gates. And uh, since then, bro, it's just been just full throttle, you know, just enjoying, you know, every aspect of life. Was there anybody, when you said you felt you never were going to come home, was there anybody who always had the hope that you would? And, and, and who was that person? Yeah, I think my mom. My mom always, like, had that hope that I would come home. Um and like there was a few other people who just kind of always like they 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 always had like that hope you know there was there was always covering me in prayer and just um believing that one day I would walk out but i just i guess that's how i did my time though i just didn't think about it you know i just yeah. didn't think about ever going home uh did they tell you how do, how do they feel when they seen you that your hafita believed you were going to come home one day uh, oh man odds that was were nice. you were. yeah odds were you weren't you walk you walk out what did she do? Man, she was crying. She was crying when she seen me. I didn't get to see her until, like, months later because of COVID. Like, it was, like, I got out in the middle of COVID. Yeah. And so uh, I didn't see a lot of people until, like, later on. Like, I seen people, like, in increments. But everybody was just kind of, like, tripping out. Like, you know, my mom was was crying, though. She couldn't believe it. And then, uh, yeah, it's been crazy. So did you get uh, – you didn't parole uh, to her pad? You would you parole to, like, a halfway house or something? Yeah, I had to as a lifer. I had to parole to a transitional house. Mm, how was that? Um, it was. I mean, it was way better than jails. <laughs> it was cool though. Like I was in a transitional house. It was only like 
six of us in the house when I first got there. So it was it was chill. Like because of COVID, they had everything like spaced out, and um, it was chill, bro. Like I had a phone. Like I was good with that. Like I was like. <laughs> <laughs> we couldn't go nowhere at first though because of COVID and stuff. But I think just the fact of of having a phone was like that alone was enough for like the first few months. You know what I mean? That must have been a trip though. G like getting out to like everybody locked down. You just it felt out? like jail still. Like it felt <laughs> like jail. Like it's like you can't really go nowhere. But like <laughs> it was crazy. <laughs> and uh. So that must actually though that must have made it a little easier to transition though, right? Because everybody's kind of going through it. So you're kind of going through it with everybody getting off of these restrictions little by little. Or did yeah, it? It definitely did. It definitely helped me like it, it was slower for me. Like I see other people coming home and I see like everything, like they get in the groove real fast. Like they kind of get just thrown out the nest. Whereas me, I got to kind of chill. And then, like, you know, do the DMV thing little by little and do this little by little. Like, I didn't have a lot of that pressure because the world was shut down. So, yeah. Yeah. So, so what are you up to now? Um, now, um, just working and going to school. I'm going to school right now for, um, for criminal justice. So, um, I'm trying to do my part. You know, I'm trying to do my part. And, um, I- I'm hoping to be a lawyer. That's, 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 that's the goal. The goal is law school, but um, that's a lot of schooling, too. I don't know. We'll see what happens when, when I get this bachelor's. But I want to do criminal justice just to kind of be – so, I, like, I have my story, but I want to be better equipped to to speak to a variety of people and just kind of um, help make better policy, help yeah. uh, continue to, to be a part of policy that's being made, lobbying, changing people's minds, the way they think about things, showing them that, you know, change is possible, that – you don't have to throw away, throw away people. You know, even if they've made terrible decisions, like there's people are redeemable still. And that's, and that's what I believe. That's why I, I like to talk to uh, a lot of youth defenders, because a lot of the times with these youth defenders, that's why I always tell people we have to think really hard and and before we start thinking about just throwing these numbers at kids, right? Because mm-hmm. like Stephen said, the brain isn't even really developed until you're about 25, 26 years old. Right. So it's like you're sending these kids away for the rest of their lives. And a lot of times when we, I don't know, tell me what you think. This, I think when we send kids away at a young age, we kind of develop them to become more hardened. And I well, do you think, go ahead, my bad. Well, you've seen it like even in the, like DJJ is supposed to close down completely in 2023, right? Like it's supposed to close down. But even like, like YA, like, you know, you're sending kids into like gladiator school and then you're, you're sending kids into, into, you know, prisons where, um, some of them are, I don't care like how much you've learned growing up in the hood or whatever, like you're naive and you're gullible to certain things, you know? And so you're putting people in these, these situations where sometimes you make worse criminals. Yeah. You know what I mean? That's the reality is like, sometimes you, you send somebody maybe, um, who, who did something wrong. Right. But you send them into an environment where they can become worse instead of like providing, um, an opportunity and providing skills for them. To develop and which they're doing a lot better now like there's still a lot to do but now um like they, they, with the close of djj they're trying to make it to where you can you can like leave with a bachelor's and you can get other opportunities i mean it's still a lot a lot of work a lot needs to be done but i don't think kids are meant to be sent to prison and they're definitely not meant to be sent to prison for life you know if if the brain science shows that the brain's not fully developed till you're 25 then why not build these these kids up who who made uh, bad decisions and help them become you know men or women that that can contribute to society? Like doing some kind of skills, some kind of education, so that they're and and uh, address the trauma. Like you said, you have had uh, insecurities. If those insecurities were were dealt with beforehand, that that may have made your your uh, your journey a little easier. Although right. everybody's journey is their journey, right? You wouldn't be the right. same you are today without it but at the same time maybe you may not have been as lucky and did the whole hundred years right yeah uh a lot of people want to know what happened with uh uh juan antonio and daryl so um juan he goes to board in july he actually goes to board next month um so hopefully he gets he gets that date but the unfortunate part and the thing that we've been trying to fight but it's it's federal is um if he gets found suitable, they're gonna deport him. 
Yeah. So that's another struggle and that's another battle that doesn't make sense. Like, how are you going to send a kid to prison for life? And then once he's changed his life and you deem that he's no longer a threat to society, now you're going to deport him. Like, that doesn't make any sense at all. Yeah, it was difficult. You're deporting him to places that they don't really know. Yeah, you've been you've been you've grown up in America, whether that was in jail or not. Like you've grown up in America, and now they got a phone call. We'll let him come back on right now. We'll see if he comes back on right now. But yeah, um, no, it's a, it's a trip, man. It's a trip. Homie stood a. Uh, uh, it's crazy because he says he he didn't uh, uh, expect to come home, but his family was rooting for him. People were rooting for him, and and it's a trip that he was able to to make it back. Right? Like who who'd have thought? I think I think that's him right there coming back. All right, G, you hear me? Hello. Cool, cool. Yeah. yeah. But yeah, no, I, I agree. Like uh, he. Damn, he grew up here, right? Like, what's yeah. he gonna do out there? He's probably not even equipped to because you're gonna have to learn all over again. It's like you're learning a whole different environment. Yeah. So uh you want to go uh be a lawyer and uh you know criminal justice and 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 do all that. Um, are you gonna focus on youth or, or are you gonna uh, just with everybody? Um both. I feel like it goes hand in hand though, like like mm -hmm. following people who've who've gone in because like like one of the biggest battles is like LWAP. Like there's no that's something that I think that um definitely needs to be addressed is um the life without the possibility of parole. Like that's that's like the worst like it's like a it's kinda like a loophole of giving somebody the death penalty. So it's like we're not really gonna sentence you to death, but we're kinda sentencing you to death, right? Like we're not gonna do it, but you're sentenced to die in the state, you know? And I think that Get, at least giving somebody like the opportunity to go in front of the board or or work towards something is it just makes sense right like it, it just doesn't make sense to give somebody a sentence of life without yeah so i think i think even like focusing on some of that and um i think just some of the injustices that take place even like um i, I learned everything is is like laws you know everything has to do with laws and so i think just kind of being well versed that i want to be uh well versed in that area to kind of create better policy yeah, or, or just come alongside those who are already doing it. Cause I know we're probably where, where you were, uh, you know, yeah, you've seen a lot of lifers there, but for the, for most of the prison population, they're going to come home one day. And that's one thing I always try to stress to people is most of the prison population is to come home. Right. So you have to think what kind of neighbors do you want? Right. right. Like, geez, so we, yeah, I, I think that we, there should be some policies set up so that, you have these men and women who are locked up and have a way to come back and reintegrate into society uh, in a way that's not as difficult or they don't have as many hurdles because you already paid the price with your freedom. And now you're going to come out and pay the price for the rest of your life. I don't know. I made a lot of mistakes when I was a kid. I ain't trying to pay for them for the rest of my life. Right. And I think that that kind of like when people come home, like one of the things that's going to keep people home too is like we don't want people who come home from prison right a lot of the time they went to prison because they didn't have money mm -hmm. like the reality of the fact is that majority of prison is filled with people from poverty and so i think that we need to help uh, people develop skills so that when he when they are released they can go into jobs making more than minimum wage Right. Because it's like if you come home and, and you're you're barely surviving, like that pressure and that stress that's on you, like you're liable, like the best the best of people are liable to to fall into some criminal behavior. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Now, they want to know how old are you now? I'm 26 now. 26. Damn, you're still young, G. Yeah. So you, you got the, the whole world ahead of you. You know what I mean? Uh do you think your 17 year old self would trip out to see where you're at now? Definitely. Sometimes I look back though and I'm like, damn, why did I go through all that? 
to like come full circle and have to like go to jail and get my GED. Like I dropped out of school to have to go back to school, right? Like so, <laughs> so, so sometimes I'm like, like you big dummy, like you should have just did all this stuff the first time and you would have been good. Like instead, you know, you wanted to be hard headed. And I went this whole other journey. And but I think definitely um I think I always knew I had potential. It just I guess it just kind of got it was the quiet voice after a while. So I want you to, uh, uh, w- w- based on your experiences, uh, give advice to two different types of people. First one, uh, what would you say to to the youngsters out there that are dealing with, uh, whether it be insecurities, frustration, anger, pain, uh, trauma in their life? W- what would you say to them thinking about, you know, out, being out there in the streets and thinking they have no other choice? Man, I think I would say to them, like, man, love yourself. like. I feel like oftentimes, you know, people come with the same approach, like, oh, the homies aren't going to be there for you. They're not going to yada yada, like all that, right? Like, Mm. you don't really want to hear that when you're young, right? I think it's more so just like, man, learn to love yourself, right? Because nobody else is going, if nobody else loves you, you keep hurting yourself. You're the only person that you have left to love yourself. Yeah. I mean, you're the only person that you have left that can love you. So, man, you got to learn to love yourself. You know what I mean? Like, like, it's what we're doing, really loving ourselves. And I think, um, like, tr- like trust, like trusting, finding somebody, like, like, tr- like finding somebody, and and it kind of comes to like, not so much what I would tell them, but like what I tell like, the worst thing I think to hear is like a grown man or a grown woman saying like, oh that's a bad kid, like, mm-hmm. like that's a kid, like what do you mean that's a bad kid, like you just like that's a bad apple, like just throw him off, like he's just, it's like nah, you need to invest in that child's life, they need extra attention, you know what I mean, like they need extra love. Yeah, I feel I feel like it's more of of us coming alongside the youth in our community, and it's not even so much what you tell them, but it's like what you show them. Yeah, like exactly. I can tell you all day like a lot of beautiful things, but it's like where are you at though? You know what I mean? Like you're not alongside me though. You're not out here trying to see if I if I can if I eat dinner tonight or not. You know, like that's what a lot of kids are faced with, and a lot of people want to come and tell them nice things, but nobody wants to stand alongside them or. Or, or really show them how to how to come out of this by walking alongside them, you know? Yeah, because kids are smart. They, they'll, they'll know what society feels about them, right? right. They'll, they'll, they'll realize it. And if they feel, and it's sad, if they feel nobody cares about them, their empathy is going to be a lot. They're going to have a lot less empathy, right? So they're going to be like, nobody cares about me. Why should I care about anybody? It is a sad thing, man. It's really a sad thing. We go, we have to be empathetic to it towards each other and especially towards children. You could change children. Right. Like they're 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 sponges, they could absorb a lot. So I, I don't know. That's it's it's a trip, man. Yeah. So, so yeah, and uh before we wrap it up, is there anything else you wanted to add, G? Man, that's it, man. I appreciate um everybody who took the time to watch. Um and I and I thank you, bro. I thank you for, for us having this this conversation, you know, just having this dialogue. I appreciate you, G. Honestly, because, like I said, I, I as when I watched that, I, I even like I, I seen a lot of how I, I was the same way when I was a kid. I thought everything was a joke. I wonder why. Ah, I don't care. Whatever, whatever. Then along the line, you kind of start growing up. Like, hey, jail fucking sucks. Like this really sucks, right? <laughs> and, and I saw a lot of uh, myself in you, where the way you're laughing and not taking it seriously, and I was like, ah, oh, man, there's there's something inside. There's something inside of this kid. There's something bothering him. And I'm glad that you were able to use the tools that you had to change that around. Because like you said, and I want to bring you on and people like you on so they could understand, people could understand and and humanize youth offenders and know that there's more to them, right? Like it would have been a complete waste if we would have just threw you away, dog. There's a lot you have to offer society. There's a lot you have to offer the community. What good would you do in jail? I'm sure you could have impacted a few lives in there, but you could impact a whole lot more out here. That that's kind of the way I look at it, and that's why I wish others would see. And hopefully, little by little, um, we can you know get that 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 message out there. Corey does have a question, uh, real quick. Uh, how is his relationship with the sisters now? Uh, they took it pretty hard when he was incarcerated. Um, it's it's a lot better now, you know, like now that we're able to FaceTime and, and just call each other, text, um, I'm able to be a big brother to them again, you know, like actually be here for them, you know, talk to them, walk them through things. And um, it's a lot better today. 
All right, that's what's up. They're I want really to... happy on home. Yeah, that's what's up, G. Well, well, cherish the moments, dog. You you got a great life ahead of you. Again, I appreciate you taking the time. Uh, I wish you the best success, and, and uh, you know, go go out there and show them, G. Show them what we're made of. Absolutely. Thank you, brother. I thank you. You have a good one, and thanks to everyone in the chat. Uh, thanks for everyone tuning in. Much love to the nasty crew. Much love to all my white babies. And with that, we out. Peace.